Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Welcome to the next episode of Decoding AQ. With me today, joining us from Ohio, is Dr. Nadia Shuksimbaiva. She is the Chief Reinvention Officer at the Reinvention Academy, and Nadia helps corporations thrive in perpetual turbulence and capitalize on disruption. So teaching her science-based methods to help a billion people reinvent continuously. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Russ. So a little bit more background before we get stuck in. So Dr. Nadia is renowned for her exceptional ability to guide people and organizations through waves of, of change. So she's dubbed the reinvention guru, the queen of reinvention, and her expertise empowers giants like the Coca-Cola company, L'Oreal, IBM, Cisco, and also countless startups to thrive amidst change. She's an author and written multiple books. I'm going to give you some of them. Embedded Sustainability, The Next Big Competitive Advantage, Overfished Ocean Strategy, maybe a play on the Blue Ocean Strategy, Powering Up innovation for a resource deprived world, Titanic syndrome, I love the name, why companies fail and how to reinvent your way out of any business disaster. And Nadia's fourth book, and in fact, the, her latest book, this one that I have here, is called The Chief Reinvention Officer's Handbook, and it's how to thrive in chaos. It was a finalist in the American Book Fest Awards, the winner of 2021 Axiom Business Book Awards and the winner of the Kirka Star. So her work extends beyond not just writing and consulting, but also educating leaders across the globe, inspiring audiences with her compelling TEDx talks. And she's here to share how we can all harness the power of change for competitive advantage. So let's dive into some of this science, some of this reinvention. But I'd like to start off in a way that we start many of our weekly stand-ups, Nadia, which is called a positive focus. And I'd like you to think about your last week and share either a positive achievement or something you're truly grateful for from last week. Absolutely. The greatest moment of last week personally was to have my daughter come from college. She's second year. And it's always a refresher to see the speed of change in a human being. So every few weeks, she's a new person, and it's absolutely a, a visualization of everything I study. I study speed of change. I study what makes one system able not only to survive that change, but actually become better and elevate, and other systems get completely destroyed and crumble under the pressure of change. And that system could be an individual, a family, a team, a department, an organization, a whole society. And since I come from a society that doesn't exist anymore, USSR, for me, that was a very personal quest to try to understand how can we find a way to reinvent through a healthy evolution rather than a massively destructive revolution. It's interesting, isn't it? We have you know, these things that um, happen to us and we call change. And it's, I, I, I listened uh, actually to the masterclass that Jay uh, Shetty, and he used this phrase, the change we choose or the change that chooses us. And it's quite interesting when you reflect on that, when we, you know, have family members and, you know, we might spend a bit of time away from them. And then when they come back, I always remember, you know, going to at various stages, wow, you've grown or you've changed or you've shifted partly physically, but also partly mentally, right, in terms of how we think and how we adapt uh, our thoughts. So, yeah, great uh, to have your daughter back uh, and experience that. It's lovely. We've just had uh, two weeks ago was Mother's Day. Mm. And um, my wife has two grown up sons and I have uh, six grandchildren and they were over um, for a sleepover. And it was just fascinating to observe you know, what they do, how they speak, different language, all sorts of things, you know, about change. Absolutely. But this is, I think, is one of the most beautiful things to start any kind of um, adaptability journey is to start at home. 
I think mm. that's the easiest way to bring uh, immediate results, but also come back to how natural we are. I always say to all of our clients and all of the Reinvention Academy professional students where exec ed only organization, and I always tell them, you don't need to become a reinventor. You were born with it. You might have been educated out of it <laughs> yeah. so it's on learning, but it's not that you are learning something new. It's like riding a bicycle. You will recover that skill because you reinvented thousands and thousands of times in your life. And we often, you know, we we want to fit in, we want to comply, you know, and at certain points in life, teenage, midlife, various points, we might rebel against some of those systems and things around us. But essentially our our ability to observe, to understand what don't we like, what do we think are injustices or things in the process or systems that aren't giving optimum outcomes. And what do I want to do about it? And like you say, reflecting at home or in oneself is part of that journey, isn't it? And I'd like to, you know, take back to what led you, because I know that you studied management, organizational psychology, you know, and you've been in this field now a few decades. What was it that led you into studying that and perhaps some of the key journey moments? Because I know sustainability was a key component for you before Ah, maybe we need to think differently about how we reinvent the way we create value in the world. Absolutely. So I came to the US in um, 1998. And in 2001, I had the luxury of joining a, a PhD program. And there was no question that my historical background is what defined my interests and curiosities. I come from a family um of political dissidents. My great-grandfather was executed. My grandfather was pushed into orphanage after his successful career as a, as a journalist, arrested, tortured, and he killed himself before I was born. So if you think of every family member, I can tell the same story. On my mother's side, it was very much a century of tremendous tragedy and disruption that ended in the collapse of that horrific machine called USSR, but the collapse itself was equally horrific. So then the question I was driven by is, is there a better way? Can we sustain and increase levels of life in the system rather than continuously seeing them destroyed? And what are the triggers? What can we do to increase the likelihood for the system to still be there? Naturally, the easiest um, systems to study uh, became businesses because they have a vested interest. They're very nimble. They are open doors to the researchers because they have the same vested interest. We, they want to exist in perpetuity. They don't want to go bankrupt or be swallowed by uh, some do, but very few actually want to be swallowed. I always joke with the merger and acquisition specialist. I have never seen a single merger in my life. It's always an acquisition. It's just a polite, politically correct way of presenting it. So then my starter base was businesses, but businesses don't exist in vacuum. There's no line where business ends and a citizen starts. A customer is simultaneously a an organization, an individual, but they're part of a larger ecosystem. So because of that, you cannot sustain an organization without sustaining an ecosystem. This is where the financial sustainability overlaps with economic, um, larger economic, environmental, social, and any other form of sustainability. And I come from systems thinking. So there is no place where environmental ends and social starts. So whenever people start dividing them, it's very funny thing for me because there's no such thing as just social problem. There's no such thing as just environmental problem. And frankly speaking, the planet doesn't care. It doesn't. It will be there tomorrow. It's been there before us and it will be there after us. The only reason we care about climate change is because it's a fundamental threat to humans. The planet had climate change many times. Just some living beings did not survive it. The planet is fine. So um, 
those of you who haven't seen this video, there's a beautiful, you can open YouTube right now and just say Planet Earth Julia Roberts. There's a beautiful something like two minute clip that was voiced over by Julia Roberts on that subject. But literally, this is not, a. we don't need to save dolphins. The living systems are beautiful because they don't care which life survives as long as life survives. So we are completely expendable. We don't need to exist. We have no function. We, unlike bee or an ant, we have zero functional benefits to this living ecosystem. So for planet, we're completely expendable. So there is no environmental problems. They are all social problems and all social problems are automatically economic problems if you look from the point of view of um, systems thinking. So when I started, I started from the business side on a large system survival. And it brought me to close interaction to the beautiful field of sustainability, where we did indeed wrote a few books. And I became, um, with a lot of gratefulness, uh, Coca-Cola chaired professor of strategy and sustainability at the executive education only business school, which shades your thinking when you're only working with exec executives. You are automatically thinking big picture and big systems. And one day... Uh, I think it was 2011, 2012. I was a keynote at a conference and other keynoters were sitting with me um, afterwards at a dinner, after all of the keynotes were done. And there was a person on the right of me who turned to us and said, do you have hope? All the data that you are scanning every day. You have to ask yourself that question. Do you have hope? And we went around the circle and one by one, we all agreed that we are passing the moment of prevention that already in 2012, 2011, it was very clear that when we talk about water and water is um, worse, water is food, water is everything. When we talk about monetary system sustainability, when we talk about climate sustainability, when we talk about resource depletion, whatever we touch, uh, and all of them, when they become stressed, become sources of war. And right now in 2024, we have the largest number of uh, active violent conflicts on planet Earth that we had since Second World War. So we are living that reality. We agreed that we passed the moment of prevention, that whatever horrible things we didn't want to happen, most likely will happen this century. And I had a seven, eight-year-old kid on my hands. And I had to ask myself, okay, if this is what she inherits from me, then what is the next best thing? I cannot prevent it anymore. It's too late. And the next best thing was adaptation. And that's how Reinvention Academy was born and the commitment to make the rest of my life be about the idea, how do we give masses, critical masses skills to reinvent and do it at a scale. And this is where we focus. We focus on organizations in our community. We have nonprofit public sector uh, leaders, but of course, heavy, heavy focus on business reinvention. And unlike what I used to call reinvention 1.0, one-time project, we're now living in reinvention 2.0, which is continuous reinvention. It's like taking a shower. Yeah. I don't take a shower on a regular basis. I begin to stink. If I don't wash off my habits, my practices, my mindset, my products, my services, my business models, they begin to stink too. Yeah. And it's the concertina effect, isn't it? From this compounding acceleration, you know, uh, Salim Ismail and Peter Diamandis talk a lot about this in exponential organizations, in just this speed of change from where perhaps we could create something good, patent it and sell it for a few generations and we'll be okay. And a few generations later, we'll figure out something uh, new and then we'll continue. And the lifespan of organizations used to be fairly reasonable. And it's slowly, you know, compressed that, you know, the companies in the S&P 500, you know, going from multiple decades down to, you know, 14 years down to less than 10 years, seven years, five years, what the average time is. And you talk about, you know, reinvention being required regularly, daily shower or reinvention at an organization level every three years. Now, for some people, that's exciting. For others, it's incredibly, you know, uh, fearful. And I've only just figured out what we're doing. We've only just got the process in place and the system in place. And we're now having to rethink uh, about that. And so I think it the 
um, the business case for it, the compelling conceptual theory of this makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. But the reality of then the implementation and execution has a complexities of people, beliefs, mindsets, where I've come from, you know, uh, how I've been given an applause before. All of these things become then the, the inertia, the immune system that organizations have that make it very difficult, right? Because they've been wired for efficiency, wired for productivity. And we're now looking at being wired for imagination. Um, and I talked in one of my early books about entering into the imagination economy, where we need to be doing things that you're talking about of, you know, how do we reinvent? So that question of why reinvention or why now, can you answer that together with what does actually reinvention mean? Is this innovation? You know, what's the term? Give us some foundational uh, thinking, Nadia. Absolutely. So indeed, we do a lot of research on the speed of change and beautiful work by many authors and also organizations, including the Accenture Global Disruption Index and their new rename on that on Change Index. We see the IMF's Global Uncertainty Index, and there's tons of beautiful attempts to capture this new world. And every time I show this data in the last year, and only in the last year, the audiences keep telling me, well, yeah, there's nothing new, right? The Accenture index, 200% growth in level of disruption in the last five years. Well, we thought 50, but yeah, 200. And then I asked them, okay, so what did you change in your daily life based on this data? And the answer is zero. We changed zero. And one of the first places where you start seeing the impact is your weekly agenda. If you are assuming that at least 20% of your agenda will be dedicated to things you cannot possibly predict, the disrupted space, and you book those 20%, your life will be fundamentally different than if you book to the 100% and they address disruption in the evenings, weekends, firefighting, stressed out, and uh, compound stress is similar to compound change speed. The compound stress grows and grows, and now we are collectively in burnout and in change fatigue. So we see that the data is clear, the why is clear, but the what and the how is not happening. And our latest research, which we're just starting out right now, the Global Reinvention Survey for 2024, indeed, we saw the data where the business model cycles used to be for a typical business model as long as 75 years, shrunk at the end of the 20th century to 15, shrunk even further to about six. The data that I just opened up for this year with the first few hundred respondents is too early to say, but it's already very clear. Over 22% of companies are reinventing every year or less. They're reinventing faster than the budgetary cycle. These are your customers, these are your suppliers, these are your competitors. It may not be directly you, but it is somebody in your supply chain, which is shifting the entire context of what you are to do. Now, what is reinvention then? There is the content and there's a process. On the content side, reinvention is all about managing a diversified portfolio of initiatives. So you just mentioned how short is a lifespan the shelf life of a typical solution. It used to be you could find a solution and milk that cow for 10, 20, 30 years with a patent, with a business model, essentially not really changing anything outside of incremental change. And that's why we had in the 70s and 80s the rise of Kaizen, Lean Six Sigma, quality movement, because you didn't need fundamental anything. You could do tiny, tiny incremental improvements. Now, today, the shelf life of any solution, whether it's a decision, a product, a service, career choice, professional career choice, that shelf life is sets. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's shrinking and shrinking. So you cannot bet on one perfect golden solution. You need a diversified portfolio that is dynamically managed, meaning that you routinely take things off that portfolio, add to that portfolio. And for us, we have this tool called Reinvention Portfolio Canvas. We track nine different types of reinventions, going from 
very small level subsystem incremental change, something like updating uh, the lights on the car to a system level change all the way to ecosystem really radical innovation. So it is combining innovation, incremental change, everything in between with nine different types of reinvention. On the process side, we're talking about creating a cadence of continuous reinvention where you are proactively renewing your organization, not waiting for the, the things to come in and disrupt you. And in that cadence, it's really three fundamental steps, which are anticipating change, designing change, and implementing change. And different disciplines traditionally run those different steps. Anticipating change very often is future risk. This is strategy. This is economic forecasting. This is foresight. On the design change, it's innovation, design thinking, um, all kinds of things that help you come up with creative solutions. And on implementing change, we've seen change management, project management, Scrum Agile, and many other. The problem is these camps usually fight with each other and point fingers and not exactly in love with each other. Strategy would avoid the wishy-washy change managers. Change managers don't like to look at numbers. Innovation people want to live in their own universe. I'm grossly exaggerating and I'm making fun of my own field. So please don't take it personally. But generally speaking, these are worrying camps. And our goal at the reinvention movement is to create a unifying bridging platform that allows all these camps to make peace and start passing the baton seamlessly in a cadence and the flow that is custom made for each organization. I hope that answers Hundred percent. A whole bunch and of theory, right there. Yeah, we're, we're talking about a change in the operating system to be relevant to the context we now live in. Yeah. So, where you mentioned before, Lean Six Sigma, Kaizen, where we had knowledge, we had data, and we can look at incremental change. To now, where we've got to imagine, we've got a foresight, we've got to predict because we've got less certainty. So, we have this challenge, don't we, of where. When we're, it's unpredictable, where there are complex problems, we increase stress that impairs our cognitive ability to learn, to problem solve, to do all of these things. So as a biological reaction, we have to put then certain systems in place for a different way of working than we were before. And so it does have this not only cross-divisional and cross-functional aspect, it's also then taking these aspects of psychology, you know, when it was first studied about, you know, depression and bad to, well, let's study happy or good. Let's not study coping. Let's study thriving. Let's, you know, think about things differently in organizations. And one of the challenges you mentioned earlier, the, the phrase unlearning, that's a, another one of our dimensions that we measure the science of unlearning and how people can go from, you know, a aspect that they have a deep rooted belief in to being open-minded that that belief could be shifted versus a value oh this is something I find important versus I believe in it but if I have new data new information will I change my belief or not I think many people can get that you know mixed up and difficult or oh, I have a belief in this and I'm going to stick to it and I won't allow something to shift that no matter how much data no matter how much this doctor says this or my friend says this this is what I believe and I'm sticking to it. And so the the we see this a lot at the moment when you get these big transitions, you know, when you go from different energy providers, from coal to nuclear to wind to in the future fusion, or we see different areas of these things that start as just little pockets, but just not evenly distributed. The distribution now happens at speed. Absolutely. And the I think the real reality that people are struggling with is what does that mean for people in these businesses in these systems where we scale through yes some efficiencies of you know robotics of industrialization but there were still realms of creativity realms of empathy realms of customer support that you know all oh, the writers strike for the writers guild or creative nothing is really in inverted commas safe from technology no. It's no. all process. It's all mapping, you know, and figuring out patterns. 
and looking for the gaps in patterns. So the realms of what we think are uniquely human elements, I think is going to be blurred. I think it's going to be blurred sooner than we think. And the this shift of what does it mean to program? We can now have a you know software engineer that is an agent that's AI that we can uh, you know have the conversation with rather than that person called Steve or that lady called you know Nancy, whatever it may be. So I'm I'm curious as to how in this reinvention at an organization level that you have these accelerators of technology, of processes, of environmental shifts, societal shifts. What's going on on the ground? You know, you've educated and got an army now of professionals that are helping organizations with this. What's happening on the ground? What are they doing? What does that look like when you say agenda changes for 20 percent on my week for disruption? What does that mean? Do I just color it green and say open for new things? And what does it look like? Is it reading? Is it watching stuff? Walk us through a little bit of some of the down in the weeds of what what that really looks like for companies. What does that uh, entail with some of the professionals working with the organizations? Absolutely. So the portfolio of initiatives that usually get started to start moving towards continuous reinvention changes very heavily from company to company. And we are now present in 42 countries. So um, it's really, every time I hear from one of our graduates what they're doing with the tools, I'm blown away. They're using the tools I've never imagined to use. So for example, one of the tools we have, a uh, Agile Strategy Canvas, and I always used it for enterprise level strategic planning. We now have a CEO of a marketing agency that now has it as a standard in all contracts because conditions change and you want to build in flexibility and agility straight into the contract. So the client also understands that as we start implementing, we might shift and change and the actual strategy will emerge. So what does it mean specifically? It starts with a lot of small incremental personal reinvention. So yes, agenda gets blocked uh, and you should now have blocks in the calendar that are, you know, you can find as creative name for it as uh, as you want, pretty much when stuff will fly in and you cannot know possibly. And what happens if that time is unused? I guarantee you have spillage from other tasks. I'm yet to find an organization just sits there and has nothing to do if they have a block of time that was blocked for unexpected and an unexpected never showed up. What we see is, however, the small changes start changing the mindset because the question, I love this uh, phrase from my teacher, Dr. David Cooper, I, the creator of Appreciative Inquiry, when he always says, inquiry and change are simultaneous. Um, it's not the answer that changes, it's the question. The moment you start questioning, what would my life look like if disruption is daily? And how do I wanna organize my life to actually enjoy it rather than endure it? Every time I come into organization and I ask them what if they know this data, why are they not shifting? Most of them keep answering in a conscious or unconscious way. We're waiting for things to normalize. We're waiting for things to go to business as usual. We're waiting for things to go back to normal, whatever that back to normal is. But they've been waiting at minimum for 15 years because the last economic recession at the global level finished 15 years ago. And never since have we had normal. But we pretend that it reminds that me of the storming, norming, forming. Oh, I'm waiting for the norming. No, we're we're in storm. That's it. There's no other world. It's storm. So <laughs> this is the new normal, and you can cuss it, you can hate it, you can see it as a punishment from God. You can be very upset about it. You can sabotage it, as the latest Gallup data showed. Massive rise of sabotage. It's not only quiet quitting. That is the problem. It's 18% of the global workforce that is what's called loud quitting. They're at work, but they're actively working on sabotaging their bosses and their organization, essentially destroying themselves. So you can do whatever you want. That is your prerogative. The world doesn't care. The speed of change will keep going up based on everything that is happening. The technological revolution is not going to stop just because you're upset over it. The question is, what do you want to do about it? And the healthy response that we've seen 
is people who say, now I want to be successful in this reality. What are the new rules of the game? How can I learn to work in that reality? It's almost like you used to driving on land and now you need to learn how to swim in water. It's a very different set of rules, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to enjoy it and not become wildly successful in it if you make an effort to understand it. And that's the mindset shift that is required. And of course, a lot of your work is on what are the components of the mindset shift that re that help you make that transition. But yes, it starts with a lot of small routine things like how do we set up our agenda? How do we run um, our budgeting? Um, there's an article I wrote on best principles on budgeting for Harvard Business Review, specifically on how do you add adaptability to your budgeting? Because we've all been in a situation where we labored for weeks and weeks, if not months, to create a budget for the new year. And two weeks into that new year, that budget is completely irrelevant because prices change, inflation happen, supply chain disruption, whatever else. That should not be the case. There are perfectly good ways to have dynamic budgeting and there are principles that can make you build the adaptability in, but you need to first change the mindset to start using some of those tools. So yes, the business practices change, the way we schedule, the way we build our agenda, the way we budget, the way we strategize. We had beautiful years of deliberate school of strategy. That's Michael Porter's work and it worked beautifully. And the principle of deliberate strategy is you make most of your decisions, not all, but 90 plus percent before you make the first move. Work beautifully in predictable environment. Remember, even I remember the time where you could take last year budget at 3% and have a new budget. Nothing changed. Why would you make a difference? Work great. Today, emerging strategy, which is really championed by Henry Minsberg, is much better school. And the popular term for it right now is agile strategy is having enterprise level solution that is still at the level of strategy about discipline and consistency, but there is agility built in. So all of these practitioners around the world, the certified reinvention practitioners, certified reinvention associates and others from our community, they're all running a portfolio of experiments together with their client organizations or the individuals, many of them are individual coaches to make life much more agile and adaptive and to make sure that the content of change and the process of continuous reinvention is there. But mindset, of course, is paramount. And I think we've gone through a transition where with leadership, with levels, with levels of decisions, it was about experience and expertise. Been there and done it before. Oh, have you got 10 years experience? Have you done it to predict that they're likely to get a good result when faced with a decision to get an answer? versus now the vulnerability of leaders. I don't know the answers, but I know the principles and the right questions. And I have trust in my team to figure out the answer that's correct today and then be given permission to say there's a new answer tomorrow. And the again, we can say these things, but living them is totally different, right? And um, we, we're in this paradox, right, where we want consistency, but also flexibility. We want, you know, two things, two components at, at the same time. And that's hard to get our heads around, right? And It is. Yeah. It is if you are attached to your old approaches. So it's very clear that a lot of that consistency um, and that stability will not anymore come from outside. So it will not be the source of that stability, whether you're talking about individual or you're talking about an organization, will not come from outside. So the source of my stability is not my diploma because my diploma becomes irrelevant very quickly. The source of my stability is not my title on LinkedIn. Um, that can come and go. I might love my company. The company can go bankrupt, as we saw with the bank's Silicon Valley Bank, the bank that was cash rich, disappeared and got swollen and completely moved into a different story in a very short period of time. There is nobody who is unsinkable anymore. Everyone is under the radar. 
and everyone can go in any moment. So you cannot bet on all these external factors, my job, my title, my education. It has to come from the inner grit and stamina. And that's why having those important elements of our internal palette or toolbox becomes so important. And same with the organization. Your stability comes from something greater than the sum of your products and processes. And I think there is an emerging appetite for that to be open to some of the more spiritual side some of the frequency and energy flow of how in utter chaos can i be calm mm -hmm. how um you know for example the monkey king in kung fu at facing death can i be playful so it's not i wait for the normalization i wait for this to happen Whatever's going on, I have the tools, the skill sets, the ability to reach coherence, to understand my heart rate variability, to do all of these things that allow me to be slow in my thinking when it's urgent and all of these bits. And I think one of the challenges is just this initial response to everything speeding up. So we've got to speed up everything. Right? We've got to speed up our processes, our decisions, our route to market. Oh, I haven't had a response for 30 seconds since I sent the Slack message or the WhatsApp or, or whatever. To have that dichotomy, that paradox of where are we accelerating? Where are we calm? And I think that is internal work. That's internal practice. That's an emergence of, you know, some call it spirituality, connection, whichever, you know, area you have, Buddhism, Monkism, those kind of things to reach this transcendence of who am I? What is my purpose? How am I creating value today? How might I create value tomorrow? And how can I dance? You know, one of our partners just uh, title of her book was, you know, dancing with chaos. And it's exactly that kind of situation is to make it feel like a poetry, like like jazz, like a dance movement than something that is friction, that's fraught, that's war. Um, and that a lot of that comes from different aspects, right? Some of it's genetics. We have genetic pre-wiring to our level of neuroticism and things to our level of stress responses. But then also what are the tools and practices we can have? So you, you mentioned about canvases, you know, cognitive strategies. There's also unconscious, embodied, you know, uh, semantic work, things that we can do to physically shift, to be ready to be playful, to be ready to reinvent. So I'm curious, you know, in this huge portfolio, 42 plus countries, lots of people doing all these radical experiments, share a couple of stories that have just been fascinating, how people have been using it, what some of those impacts have been and what's exciting about the key opportunities during this current phase of transition? Because we know we're going to be in transition every week. Um, you know, what is really exciting you that you're seeing at the moment? So one of the organizations we work with for many years is now of insulation. It's a company that produces building insulation and present in almost every country in the world. And one of the ways they embed it continuous reinvention into what they do is running regular reinvention days where there is a flow um, to bring new ideas and rapidly move it to decision making with the executive committee and the board engaged right on the site that allows them to implement whatever early experiments are emerging. And one of the first time they did it, because you can do it on any topic, there's this idea that Every time you have something new, AI, let's start from scratch. COVID, let's start from scratch. Uh, digital, let's start. No, just like a skilled musician, you can play Beatles and uh, Bach on the same piano the same way you can do different focus using the same set of tools and processes. So this particular 24-hour slow flow allowed the organization to go very, very quickly into realization, into implementation, and significantly reduce the time to pattern that company has seen in the past. And just doing it on a regular basis, it's um, very similar to breathing in and out. You cannot have a contraction all the time, neither can you have a release all the time. You need to have a, a flow in and out. 
up and down. So you cannot constantly be reinventing. You have a, a moment in the cycle where you need to relax and implement and process and all the of that. Yang. Absolutely. You know, so, real big moments of intense activity together with rejuvenation and, and refill. Absolutely. So you have the same cadence at the organizational level that you start building with repetitive practices that allow you to move very quickly. And we see that also at a lot of individual cases where a company or an individual might decide to build that kind of renewal at the personal level. So we have one of our practitioners, Kimberly De Bruyne, who is working as a personal coach. And she has developed a flow where you have a small refresh on a weekly basis, you have a bigger refresh on a monthly basis, and you have a really big refresh on an annual basis as a human being. And you build mm -hmm. it into plans and agendas, and it allows you to take an audit and ask yourself, what no longer serves me? What do I want to preserve? Where do I want to speed up? Where do I want to slow down? And having the cadence, the process itself, uh, it assures that even when you are not in a mood and you are not paying attention, having that protected space with a well-developed flow makes you much more attuned to the disruptions that you have not possibly used yourself. For myself, I'm a big advocate for personal advisory board. Mm -hmm. So if you are an executive, if you have a, a large zone of responsibility, that's particularly important because it's easy to develop what I call Titanic syndrome, this sense of arrogance and almost I'm unsinkable, I'm untouchable, I know exactly what to do, I've done this 200 times. It's a very dangerous space because both individuals and organizations are able to bring their own downfall uh, because of their own arrogance attachment to past outcomes or inability to see and adapt to new reality. So to avoid that, I built uh, my own advisory board and advisor to every executive to have two, three people with whom you meet. For me, it's about every two months. They are very diverse. They are not friends. Uh, one is from consulting field. One is a, quite a large business owner. And one is from science, from my background in academia. And they help me take an honest toll and notice trends when I need to and give me a kick about in the butt to start moving into change or implementing faster. When you have responsibility for others, that becomes even more important. So there are many different organizational or individual practices. What's common between them, it's not a project. We are past the moment where change can be treated as a project. This must become a process. Yeah. This must become a system. It must become continuous effort rather than one time I will squeeze everything out and then I'm done for the next 20 years. That I had I had a big lunch, so I don't need to eat for the next 10 years, right? Or, uh, or I brush my teeth really well. Brush right? my teeth I brush really my well. teeth very well and I'm yeah. done for the next seven years. Does not work. Worked in the 90s a little bit early to Southerns. We're way, way, way past that yeah. one. So the the fundamentals of work have shifted to speed of experimentation, to speed of learning, to being mm -hmm. able to do the reps, practice the muscles of this constant reinvention so that it doesn't become, oh, I don't like it. It's unfamiliar. It was painful because the first time you do things, it is painful. You get it wrong. You, you know, don't get the outcomes you want. But we have to have that um, belief in the process to do it, that then it becomes easier. It becomes, ah, that's just what I do. That is now work, you know, and the the way in which we help people to go through that process. I mean, we use something called uh, EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System by Gino Wickman uh, for traction as a business. And I love that framework of you know, in essence, without too much detail, every 90 days setting the six or seven big rocks for the organization and orbit around them. And then, you know, you have your midpoint reviews and then you can go, okay, now what's important? What's shifted? So we have an element of, okay, we've, we've committed to this for a certain amount of time, but we'll then establish rather than everything always in flux can be too much for, for some organizations and some people, right? Everything okay. in, in, in flux. I know you know, I, I've committed to my wife for life. That's one thing. 
I've I've now done. And yeah. that to me is now how do I enrich that? How do we adapt our relationship together rather than where's my next, you know, uh, relationship? So for all of us, we have certain things and in a business. It might be certain values. I want to be a hero to these types of people. But the way I do it is going to be totally different in a year's time or five Absolutely. years time of, of what that may be. So I've got two final pieces. We come to a, a close now. Yeah. One is you've mentioned a few times of uh, certain tools and certain frameworks. Do you have a, a favorite kind of go to tool to help people and help teams thrive through change that are they you know, as they're going through this now new rhythm, not a project, they need to make sure they they do this one. So that that's the first part. Is there a favorite tool, a go-to tool that you uh, recommend or personally use a load? Let's start with that one and then I'll do my other of question. Course. In a minute. Well, I'm uh, very, very biased. Of course, I used uh, everything from my academic bike background and a lot of favorites there um, on the individual level. You already mentioned personal um, personal focus on positive psychology. And since we've done projects together with Martin Seligman and others, it's a natural thing. Um, I am a direct, uh, direct disciple of appreciative inquiry. And you I'll drink from the same Kool-Aid. So it's it's yeah. no question. In my own toolkit, the tools vacillate, vacillate quite a lot, but the two that I use a lot is Titanic Syndrome Test. It's a very simple 15-question diagnostic. It's not meant to be super heavy it's meant to be as a door opener conversation starter and we've been super heavy in our entire community on using that set yep and we are super heavy on using the stella agile strategy canvas which is at the end of that book and by the way we'll make sure that there is a um, preview downloadable with those two tools for your audience so that they can grab both tools, the Titanic Syndrome Diagnostic and the Stella Agile Strategy Canvas, and try them for themselves. And I always say, use it in an organizational setting, but also see what does it mean for you personally, because we've seen massive shifts in families, changing conversations with their teenagers on what it means to build a career in a disrupted world, how to think about your major, if your major will disappear in 10 years and on and on and on. It creates an opening and lightness and less heaviness. A when shift from anxiety. Very much so. It creates a realm of possibility yeah. and hope and uh, a sense of we will be all right. No matter what, we'll be all right. So of course, grab the link, download it, give us a feedback on how that's working or not working for you. So Stella Canvas and the Titanic Syndrome Test. Nice. I like that. And, you know, it's this balance for us of using data and to make decisions, but also using imagination and using instinct. And I think it's that beautiful, again, coming back to the, you know, uh, paradox to the, you know, dynamics of things that it often is have we actually asked the right questions, which is what's great with some of these tools is that asking really good questions is foundational and fundamental and the answers are fluid uh, within it. So my my final question Nadia, is a question I've asked every guest and I'm sure it's going to make it into a, a, a book in, in some uh, when I maybe get to 500 or something like that. And it's around the a concept of curiosity and also unlearning, all of those things. And it's around firsts. So it was, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And what was it? Well, there are micro firsts every day, right? Almost every day. I won't say every day, but definitely every week. So you learn a new tool because you have to learn a new tool. I, I learned uh, Muriel as a board. I always use Miro. And one of my clients prefers Muriel. And this Monday, which wait, today is Monday, this morning, I finally facilitated the first workshop on Muriel. So the micro firsts are happening so much faster than ever before. The software I'm using for Reinvention Academy keeps upgrading. So half of the time, I don't know where is the control board anymore because by the time I come in, everything shifted and the colors and the structure and all of it. So they're micro firsts. On the big first, um, I want to say being a, a founder of a startup has continuously tested me, pushed me, humbled me. And it's definitely a first if you look at Reinvention Academy. The journey of that has been 
glorious and painful as you can imagine. I don't remember who said that entrepreneurship is uh, chewing on glass while we're looking into big black abyss, but it definitely, there are days when I feel that pain. And then there are days when it's touching and glorious and meaningful and everything you can possibly hope for from your life. So that's been a big, big fundamental shift first. I love it. I love it. And if I can uh, squeeze an extra one in, because your response there made me think of something else around as best you can, your vision for where you're taking the Reinvention Academy, not massively, oh, 25 year vision, but a year out. If we're having a conversation in a year's time, Nadia, what will have happened for you to be, oh, that was a great year. I'm happy with the progress we made personally and professionally. What sort of things will have shifted um, for you in this next year for the Reinvention Academy? Well, we are due for new refresh on the methodology. We, The book that you showed, the book that is behind me has nine tools. We are way over 20 right now. We just never put them together. So it's time to, whether it's a book or it's uh, some other body of intellectual work but there needs to be a refresh there and the community is testing so much that there needs to be updates and upgrades and some uh, nuanced work there uh, we are working on the very first reinvention summit which we hope to host in ireland in april or may 2025 and uh there our biggest hope is to bridge the divide between the different disciplines i know where change managers meet but I don't know where they meet with innovation strategy, agile scrum, project managers, innovation, um, design thinkers, and so on. And where that Probably in a ring. Point. Yeah. And where that is, other than, you know, in the battle yeah, yeah. boardroom, where that is a beautiful um collaborative partnership. So if we could um, realize our dream of creating that as a platform where we can not just coexist, but joyfully collaborate and nice. move into one new big field of management that is all about managing your life in a system and making sure that there is a, uh, there is a trustee for that other capital, which I call life in the system, not just financial capital, not just human capital, but managing that other capital that is becoming so much more precious and rare right now. So I think there is an elevation of um, uh, of awareness. Um, Accenture moved to reinvention as their number one topic. PwC, second year in a row, all the global CEOs, almost 5,000 CEOs, put continuous reinvention as the number one priority. We see the shift in recognition. I think there is a readiness to claim this as a new field of management and to bridge the divide between the beautiful disciplines that just have not been being too friendly. Playing well together. Yeah. yeah. Love it. Thank you. If people want to contact you, what are the best ways to get in touch? Where do they go? Learn to reinvent.com. Two is a number there. So learn number two, reinvent.com. But you can always find me on LinkedIn. And uh, if you can spell my last name and make sure that you connect grab some of our tools and shoot me a question. We are happy to partner. Fantastic. Thank you. We'll get all the links that you've mentioned in the show notes and we'll share them for everybody. Thank you for listening and see you on the next episode. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams, and organizations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review, and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.